Hello, I'm Andrew Xu, president of the College of Charleston. I appreciate your tuning in to view and listen to this conversation about history and memory. This particular program came about after a conversation I had with Kathleen Parker, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the Washington Post, who served as our commencement speaker in fall 2020. Before the ceremony, she and I were talking about current events and the lack of civil discourse. We both agreed that civil discourse should be a bedrock principle of our American democracy and that universities need to be both the training ground and the arena for these discussions. Yes, we as a complex, diverse society can hold views and perspectives that are in opposition to one another. But we must also be able to share those views and perspectives in a way that is civil and respectful. The program you're about to watch demonstrates that we can have tough conversations on tough issues, yet we can also do it in a way that is civil and respectful. I want to thank Kathleen Parker for serving as the moderator on this discussion that centers around Confederate and Jim Crow era names and monuments that are still prominent across the country on our buildings and in our parks and town squares today. I hope you will listen to the different sites presented here, be open to their viewpoints, and then make up your own mind on the subject. Now, let's turn it over to Kathleen. Hello and welcome to the College of Charleston's Forum on Civil Discourse and Public Policy. I'm Kathleen Parker, syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion today about the controversies surrounding the removal of Confederate and other statues here and elsewhere. We'll talk about the renaming of buildings that memorialize people and events that many find objectionable today, and we'll touch briefly on the incident here at the College of Charleston that prompted this forum. President Xu, shortly after arriving here to lead the college, approved the removal not of statues, but he approved the removal of two names associated with slavery that were being used by the Honors College for Scholars and a top graduation honor award for students and also a philanthropic society. Now, all things considered, this was a relatively minor move that was in fact requested by students, faculty, and the alumni, yet some in the community took offense not because they think slaveholders should be exalted, but because traditions and history are highly valued here. As most in the audience know, scores of statues around the country have been removed or toppled by protesters, most of them in the past 12 months since the death of George Floyd. It's an accident of timing that the trial of his accused killer continues today as we consider the fallout from that day last May. Some cities have been aggressive in their responses to protests. New Orleans has removed all of its Confederate monuments. Here in Charleston, a statue of John C. Calhoun was removed, despite the fact that he was not a member of the Confederacy. Calhoun did own hundreds of slaves, however, and he was an outspoken advocate for the plantation slavery system. It just so happens he also held several important positions, including he was as seventh vice president of the United States, secretary of war, and briefly secretary of state. In other cities, some of our founding fathers have come under fire, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, both of whom were slaveholders. A statue of Abraham Lincoln was removed in Boston because a slave was shown kneeling at his feet. All politics is local, they say, but the intersection of history and modern sensibilities has national and international ramifications. Our hope is to use these events as vehicles for a broader discussion focused on ideas rather than mere feelings with an eye toward greater understanding and reconciliation. Some of the questions we'll explore, who decides what's offensive? Are there alternatives to removing statues? Is it possible to compromise? Finally, what is the end point? Every era of human endeavors produce people whose behavior today would be deemed unacceptable. Do we relegate them all to museums and dustbins? Should an individual's life, regardless of achievements, and other valuable contributions be measured by the worst thing that he or she did? 
To help us try to sort out these issues, four highly regarded thought leaders have agreed to join us and share their opinions. In alphabetical order, they are Michelle Bernard. Michelle is an author and commentator, a lawyer and social activist. She's the former head of the Independent Women's Forum and now president and CEO of the Bernard Center for Women, Politics, and Public Policy. She says she believes in the Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name movements. Carl Cannon is executive editor and Washington bureau chief of Real Clear Politics. Among colleagues, he's known as a reporter's reporter. I once watched Carl chase Bob Woodward down 14th Street near the National Press Club in Washington to ask him a question. A former president of the National Press Association, Carl has won every possible award for his consistently excellent White House coverage. He's also a terrific editor, an elegant writer, and the author of several books. My Washington Post colleague, Jonathan Capehart, has too many titles to list, but I'll mention a few. First, he's a member of the Washington Post editorial board. He also hosts a podcast, Cape Up, interviewing newsmakers of the day. Recently, he became anchor of his own MSNBC show, The Sunday Show with Jonathan Capehart. Certainly not least, Robert Rosen is a lifelong Charlestonian, a historian, and the lawyer no other lawyer wants to face in a courtroom. He's also the author of several highly regarded books, including A History of Charleston. Recently, Robert wrote an op-ed for the Charleston Post and Courier on the subject that we're about to tackle. I'll let, you, let him tell you where he lands. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes for our panelists. If you'd like to comment on what another panelist has said, please feel free to speak up without being called upon. We'd like for this conversation to be as organic as possible, but please try not to talk over each other. Among other things, we want this forum to be a model of civility and decorum, which is why you four were selected. Let me start with you, Robert. As a Harvard-trained historian, you've given more than passing thought to these issues. And in your op-ed, you wrote that you were concerned about the lack of criteria for removing statues and renaming buildings. You asked, what is the end point? Um, the city of Charleston has appointed a commission to study the issue of statue removal. The state of South Carolina passed the Heritage Act in 2000, making it illegal to remove or rename any monument, marker, memorial, school, or street erected or named in the honor of the Confederacy, the Civil Rights Movement, or frankly, any part of history, without a two-thirds vote of both houses of the General Assembly. So Robert, what do you see as the appropriate legal process for making such decisions? Well, um, let me say this. I think my concern, you know, with, with this entire subject has been, of course, what's going on is simply a political and emotional um, reaction to current events. In other words, it's not like all of a sudden everyone in America is concerned about American history. Um, we are living through a very tumultuous time, a, a second civil rights movement or some kind of period in which emotions are running very high. And of course, history um, is really about the present as much as it is about the past. So I don't think we can take this subject out of the context of the political, uh, emotional period that we're in. So it's hard to talk about it in the abstract. My concern about it is, is that um, I've had a lifelong interest in Charleston's history. And, you know, we had a debate I don't know, 15, 20 years ago about whether there should be a monument to Denmark Vesey who led a slave rebellion in Charleston. I was chairman of the History Commission and I wrote an op-ed about why we should have a monument to Denmark Vesey. And you know, on that subject, I was regarded as uh, too liberal or too radical uh, in terms of you know, memorializing someone who's a very controversial figure, but who was in the black community, of course, was regarded rightly as someone trying to liberate people from slavery. Um, as time has gone on, the subject has now switched to the Confederacy. And of course, what everyone remembers is um, these, these, this debate begins with Confederate monuments. And the argument was, the argument keeps moving. It moves every week. And I, I follow it. <laughs> and I follow it every week. It's one of my hobbies. And, uh, um, the argument was that these people were traitors to the United States and they were supporting the Confederacy, which was created to protect the institution of slavery. So all of these Confederate monuments should come down. Well, at least that has a certain logic, but it quickly morphed into everything. In other words, 
very quickly that morphed into every slave owner, every white supremacist. And then one of my favorite groups is this sort of Marxist group in New Orleans, Take Them Down, NOLA, uh, New Orleans, which is, you know, basically all white. I think the word they use, the, the latest thing I looked up today was uh, white toxicity. <laughs> I mean, if you want to keep up with the movement, um, the real radicals who are driving this um, are not just talking about slavery, the Confederacy, uh, they're really talking about white supremacy, segregation, and then now the term is white toxicity, whatever that is. So my concern about it is I don't think there's any rule, any criteria. I don't, I don't know where we're headed with this. The president took the names of two people off of um, some things at the college. One was um, uh, Smith, who was the, uh, really the founder of the College of Charleston. He's really just a run-of-the-mill slave owner. I mean, he owns 200 slaves, but he's not exactly, you know, some major figure in the history of slavery. But what he was, was the first Anglican bishop of South Carolina, a hero of the American Revolution, uh, the person who created the College of Charleston. Um, so the punishment for him is he owns slaves, so his name gets wiped out. And then uh, the other name was William Aiken, who was another very wealthy slave owner who was governor of South Carolina. Um, and I guess these two, I don't know how these people were chosen, probably at random from a, uh, someone throwing a dart at a dartboard. Um, Cause actually, as it turns out, William Macon opposed secession and supported the union. Um, but I doubt whoever gave the president any advice knew any of this. So my, my concern is the randomness of it. Uh, what, you know, where, where are we going with it? You know, what is the rule? Well, Robert, those two names, of course, were raised by the, the students here and the faculty and the alumni. Let me toss this question to Jonathan. Do you think, uh, Robert made the point that some of these people have done, you know, made superb contributions to the country, as opposed to certain people who may have not been working in the best interest of the country. But, for example, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, we don't need to uh, rehash their contributions to the United States. But do you think a distinction should be made between um, those people, like the former presidents who were and were also slave owners? I mean, it's hard to talk about, it's hard to even conceive of a time when owning other human beings was, was acceptable practice, at least in certain parts of the country. But it, indeed it was in this part where we live. And so the question is, should we make that distinction? Is that a fair like sort of middle ground that we might be able to find something to talk about? Well, I mean, absolutely, there should be distinctions made. I mean, I would draw the line at, um, as Donald Trump tried to make the case um, in the campaign, they're trying to take down, move the Jefferson Memorial and take down the Washington Monument, which was uh, absurd. Uh, at the time. And I don't think there, sure, there, you can find somebody to support anything, but I would highly doubt that there were a majority of people, maybe even a majority of Black people, who would bother to spend the time debating whether Jeffers the Jefferson Memorial should be moved versus healthcare, infrastructure, the economy. Um, I take Mr. Rosen's point about, you know, there's no there are no rules here. There's no standard here. Um, and I think that is right now for the good because the decision that was made by the College of Charleston was made by the, as you said, Kathleen, the students, the community, the alumni. It was a community decision. You can agree with it or, or, or not, but the College of Charleston made that decision as a community. Um, yes, there should be there should be distinctions made, but I think um, when it comes to you know the jumping off point here, the decision to take um, to remove the names from the the scholarship and from the and from the award, that when the, if the community stands up and takes a stand and says this is what we want to do and it is approved through all the the normal channels that these these how these decisions are made then that I, that should be accepted. 
one thing I would say is, you know, in terms of removing monuments, um, you know, there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with pu putting monuments into context. Um, yes, I agree with removing Confederate monuments and putting them into um, into museums because I just don't think um, we should be revering and venerating traitors to the Union um, and people who fought to keep people, uh, my ancestors and Michelle Bernard's ancestors, enslaved. I just don't think we should be doing that. However, if you put them in a museum, fine, and put make sure that there's that there's context. If a community decides, you know what, we don't want to remove our our monuments, then a conversation needs to be had about putting up a plaque or something that puts that monument into context, or adding uh, more up to date people who are worthy of veneration that speak more to the community as a whole, as opposed to statues that for the most part were put up as as symbols of intimidation during uh, the Jim Crow era and the civil rights movement. All right, well, let me toss this question to Carl. Um, Carl, what is what should we do about places, universities, for example, that have been named for, for American leaders? Washington and Lee, of course, is named for George Washington and Robert E. Lee. And then we have the University of Virginia that memorializes is a monument to Thomas Jefferson, who essentially created it. What do you what do you say to students and alumni who graduated from those schools and, and want to continue to honor the, the names? This is not, in fact, the case at um, Washington and Lee. There's a, a pretty big movement to change those names. And you know you've got Lee's Lee is buried on the campus of WNL as we call it down here. It's um, he's his body rests inside a mausoleum that students visit uh, during one of their sort of official ceremonies. Once upon a time, that mausoleum contained Confederate flags. Those have been removed, but there is still this sort of ceremonial deference um, extended to the the remains of Robert E. Lee. What what do you what do you say to that? Well, I've been thinking about that. Um, Kathleen, about that particular school. I, I lectured there a few years ago at Washington Lee, and there was, I went to, there's a gift shop and a little museum, and I went there, and the docent was there, and she was telling some tourists, um, they, I think they were from Asia, they were, they were not Americans, and she said, I heard her, overheard her saying, well, Robert E. Lee hated slavery. That was the phrase she used, and I, I was, you know, had a couple of drinks, and I said, uh, hey, lady, you're getting out over your skis there a little bit. I mean, let's, let's not overdo it here with Lee. Look, Washington Lee, Washington Lee University, as you put it, was called Washington College. Lee became the president. There were reasons to respect Robert E. Lee in the North and the South after the war ended because he discouraged Southerners from continuing the war. He, there were people in his army who wanted to be guerrillas. He told them no. He was, a, he was a figure for a while in the United States who helped with the reconciliation of the country. He was never a racial liberal. He wouldn't pass muster among any of us today, any of his attitudes about race. He was a slave owner and he was a traitor to his country. He went to West Point, he fought against people he served with. Uh, Sherman after the war said he thought these generals should have been hanged. So, you know, Lee's a complicated figure. There is no reason in today's America we still have to honor him the way we do. This is my opinion. And my thinking on this has changed. There was a, there was a professor, a law professor at Washington Lee at the law school there. And he took a job there and immediately started agitating for the name change. And I thought, well, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. He knew what the college was called before he went there. But as I thought about it more, and, uh, and I thought about it more in one rate regard, because my oldest two children went to high school called Washington Lee High School in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, Jonathan, you probably heard of it. Um, it was called WNL. It's still called WNL, but they changed the name and they changed the name to Washington Liberty. Um, and so to me, you know, Robert wrote this essay for the paper down there and, and he's, the questions he raises are the right ones. Where do we draw the lines? With me, I draw the line on that college, Washington, yes, we know. And my, they were both slave owners, but George Washington led the army that gave us a country. He invented the presidents. Um, it, it, some people cannot overlook slavery. I respect that view, but to me, George Washington is a person who we can venerate. And when we start when we start changing names, I think 
I would hope most people in this camp panel would agree. You, you can't, you have to sum up these people where they existed in history. Um, if someone says, but wait a minute, slavery, you can't excuse that, exclude, you can't, that, that, that's the bright line. Then I would say, you apply that to Ulysses S. Grant. Some people want to do that. Well, Ulysses S. Grant owned a slave briefly. How, how did he come to own a slave? His father-in-law, who was a Southern sympathizer, and more than that, a secessionist, gave him a slave uh, when he married Julia Dent, hoping to convert Grant away from his dangerous liberal thinking. It didn't work. Grant worked in the fields with this man, scandalizing local people, treated him as an equal, ended up freeing him a short time later, when he himself, Grant, was poor. And, you know, and then, oh, one other thing, and demolish the Confederacy. So, you know, if, if you're going to say that slavery is a bright line, no, it can't be because then Grant comes under it. So we, what we have to use here to me is common sense. And I guess what my common sense says um, in Washington Lee is, you, you know, they got that half right. They don't, it doesn't have to be Washington Lee. It could just be Washington. Well, there's of course a huge, there's some, a lot of pushback on that from alumni and they're threatening to with, withhold um, donations to the school if they change the name and uh, we'll see how that resolves itself. But it was originally begun, I believe the movement uh, was begun by some, some of the black law students that were in fact in my son's graduating class because um, he did, he went to the law school there. Um, so it's built, it's built from there and um, We'll see what happens. I mean, money speaks uh, loudly, as we all know. Michelle, I don't want to. I don't. I saved you for last because you're my favorite. <laughs> um, but I want to expand on um, Robert's concern that there's no end in sight when it comes to former slave owners. Um, you know, what should we do? When do you agree that there should be distinctions made? And and how do we handle some of these? Uh, politicians whose rhetoric really just simply and you know is is so fiery and and not helpful I think to any kind of sense of reconciliation what you know what do we do with people like the mayor of Charlottesville um, I'm not recalling her name right off the top of my head but she is she's the first black woman mayor but she refers often to Charlottesville's um, you know institutional racism Sorry, this question is so long-winded, but her name is Nakuya Walker, excuse me, Nakuya Walker. <clears throat> but she goes on Twitter, and she expresses her displeasure with the city she represents. She frequently refers to Charlottesville's, um, you know, as, rape, as a rapist. She speaks of Thomas Jefferson in terms that would make you cringe. I can't repeat anything here. But, you know, how does this kind of rhetoric help how is this helpful and what are your thoughts on what role public officials should play? So I'm going to give you a long-winded answer. <laughs> well, it's a long-winded question. I deserve it. <laughs> and, I, and I want to start my answer with painting a picture. Um, several years ago, I was invited to an event at Mount Vernon celebrating the founding of Jamestown. So I go to this event and I think other than the wait staff, I was the only African-American at the table. And somehow my table starts this conversation about the founding of the country um, and about slavery. And, and somebody looks at me and says, well, Michelle, what do you think about this? You know, and, and the question was posed in a way um, that sort of said, slavery was a horrible thing, but look at this great country we have because of it. Um, and I say that to say, there's no such thing as a run of the mill slave owner. A slave owner was a slave owner was a slave owner. And, you know, I have not seen any of the mayor of Charlottesville's um, tweets or comments about Charlottesville, but, and I don't believe that University of Virginia or statues or memorials to Thomas Jefferson should be taken down, but I do believe that Thomas Jefferson was a rapist. Um, I do believe that the whole story of Thomas Jefferson needs to be told. My mm. kids and I go and we visit, well, pre-pandemic, we visited, we visit, visited Monticello every year. And I've done so every year for the last 20 years. And it's been fascinating to see the change in the way the docents talk about the University of Virginia's history and the history of Thomas Jefferson. And they have become so much closer to telling the full truth about who Thomas Jefferson was. And we know that men and women can be both good and bad at the same time. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, 
um, are full proof of that. Um, African Americans have been patient for so long. So, you know, when people ask or get upset that we want to remove these statues, um, I think there is a question of realizing that how, how often and how long the African American community in this country has been patient and looking at people, memorialize people who were despots. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it bears mentioning, I don't know if, if anybody on the panel recalls, but I just want to quote a line from um, Carolyn Randall Williams wrote uh, an op-ed for the New York Times back in June, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. And she said, you want a Confederate um, you know, monument, my body is a monument to the Confederate. And, uh, and she says, I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices and the causes of the old South. So when, when, we, when my white colleagues and friends try to ask, you know, uh, why, why do this? People like Jonathan and I, we look in the mirror every day and we see what the Confederacy, Confederacy did to our ancestors. Now, both my parents are black and my, and my family's from Jamaica. Both my parents are black. My grandparents were black, but we go back and, I, and I'm the family genealogy, genealogist and I look and I see where slavery impacted my family. Um, I was doing a family tree for my brother-in-law and literally in his tree, he's from North Car his family's from North Carolina and in his tree, um, there was a great, or a person who was looked upon about being a, as a great white minister in the town they come from in North Carolina. And when you, when it says um, who was his wife, it says probably, um, prob something, and I'm paraphrasing, but literally something like, uh, probable African woman from somewhere in Africa. So our history has been so lost that in, in, particularly in the light of what happened to George Floyd, from my perspective, it's time we look at all these many monuments and it's time we look and we say, why does the country or portions of the country revere people who earned a living, literally raping African-American women, breaking up the black family, all in the name of wealth. And I think as long as the whole history is taught, then we're okay. And I think it's like the Supreme Court said about pornography, you kind of know it when you see it. You know a monument when you see it, that it should come down and you know a monument that shouldn't come down. But, and I agree with Jonathan, all of these monuments should be placed in museums and um, American children and the world should be taught the full history of who those people were and what they did and why. Thank you, Michelle. I'm gonna pause here for a moment and read a question and a scenario that was um, offered by a College of Charleston student. <clears throat> Her name is Kananda Williams. She's an elementary education major from Greeleyville, South Carolina. And she writes as follows. As to keeping Confederate monuments, I can logically understand the historical value as representing an era in history. But as humans and civilizations, we evolve. We are far more advanced empathetically. I would like for you to stop for a moment and think about your favorite grandparent or ancestor. Now imagine that loved one being brutally beaten, raped, and or murdered by the hands of another. However, the assailant perhaps did some things that were beneficial to some people. Let's say the community then erects a monument to that person. Please describe the emotions you may feel as you drive past that monument. Well, I think that's a good question for white people to think about. Empathy is, I think, probably the, the, most, the strongest, most important tool we have in trying to understand how other people experience things. And, and my question, and I'll toss this one to Jonathan, is there another, should empathy be turned the other way as well? Now, I'm not saying feel what people feel about Confederate generals. That's not important in this, in the way I'm seeing this question. But a lot of people in the South had family who fought in the Civil War. They weren't slave owners. They had no wealth. They had no stake in, you know, they weren't gonna benefit um, from the continuation of slavery, but they were called to arms against what was characterized as, as an, an invasion. And I can say I had relatives fight in both sides of the Civil War. I'm glad that half of my family fought on the correct side. I'm talking about the North, 
Um, but I'm proud of those people from the South who were so brave and who lost limbs and lost everything, ultimately, lost everything. Houses burned to the ground, everything, gone. They need to feel some pride in their family and their heritage. Now, would you deny them that? And isn't there some way for both sides to sort of see that there's something that can be valued without honoring the people who really drove that war and who brought us to the worst clash in American history? Gosh, Kathleen, thank you for that very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't mean to give you an easy question. Holy smokes. Okay, listen. Wait, Jonathan, before you answer, can I just, I, I just want to throw something out there to see how you answer it. Because when Kathleen made, um, posed the question to you, the first thing that came to me, to my mind, and I'm wondering if it came to your mind and how you will respond is, what do you, what do you, if your family fought in the civil war against their will even, what do you, what do we mean when we say preserving heritage? Like what is, that's the first thing I thought, well, was, was Kathleen, well, what do you, like what heritage are you preserving? What your ancestors did, what the South did, like what do you mean when you say heritage? Cause that's- Well, I think what I'm trying to, ref what, I'm, what I'm saying is that there are people who just, who feel that the, t the tearing down of the monuments and other, other efforts to, to sort of soften history a little bit are, I think they feel that it's an assault on them and their family. It's a matter of pride, which may be misplaced, but it, nonetheless, I think it exists. And I'm not, I'm not defending anyone that you know, wants to wave a Confederate flag. I, I, I'm scared to death of the people who do that. But um, I'm, it's just a, a, in the abstract, is there, do they have, and I'm not saying preserve heritage in a physical way necessary. I'm just saying, is it, is it fair to allow that part of their story to be told um, as well as the, 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 the terrible things that were done? They were also, I mean, do we, do we care about people who were, were brave and who, were, who lost their, their limbs and who lost their homes and their means of existence. I mean, is there any room there for, for empathy? Um, <clears throat> I like to think of myself as a very empathetic person. Um, I, have, I have come to realize of late that when it comes to um, the Confederacy, um, in the abstract, those folks who want to um, preserve their heritage as it relates to the Confederacy and revere their ancestors who fought on behalf of the Confederacy, that's where my empathy sort of runs into a brick wall because of what the Confederacy meant um, for the country uh, writ large, what it meant for Black people in particular, and the argument that, um, you know, we didn't own slaves. That was way back when, um, you know, that's not who we are now. Unfortunately, the Confederacy, the, well, unfortunately in the sense that the Confederacy didn't win, slavery was abolished, but a system, it was still maintained where white people in the United States um, benef still benefit from the white supremacy um, that has been part of our country since its founding and is still ongoing today. We're in the middle of a trial at the Derek Chauvin trial where a lot of our original original sin is on display. It is on trial. And so, I mean, I hear, you know, I have an open heart and I have an, an open mind and, and, and open ears, but I just can I cannot get there um, with the the, um, the argument that you you present to Kathleen. Okay, I, I, I hear you. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and but that doesn't mean that you know you know you have these you have these monuments. They were up, people revered them. But now the country has changed. The South has changed, and there are people who are rising up and saying this is not good. This is telling one part of our history. Um, to, you know, without having, saying anything 
about the other part of the other part of our history. Put those monuments in museums. Tell people where they were, why they were up. But we have to, to Michelle's point, this all goes back to it is time to tell the more complete, accurate, and true history of the United States. And that's why I think the 1619 Project was so spectacular and took off and is so popular because finally, from my, from my point of view, the history of the United States was told in um, very raw, real, uh, true fashion. And as we know, you know, history is not static. History is, I mean, yes, it's, history is written by the victors, but how many books are there on George Washington or Lincoln, Gandhi, King, um, even the history of the United States? They're untold numbers because depending on who's writing the book, you get a different perspective. And I think that for a lot of people, the 1619 Project was like water on a very dry piece of earth that we finally were able to see with a little more clarity, in some cases a lot more clarity, a fuller picture of the founding of the United States and how we got from 1619 to today. It puts a lot of things into perspective that it's happening today. And so I think as long as, you know, the, the ancestors of the Confederacy, um, you know, are, are pushing to keep their heritage alive um, or to revere it or to have others respect it, that is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And that now that, you know, Black people and others of conscience are pushing to have the fuller story told, that they also have to be empathetic and open and have open hearts and open minds to hearing the fuller part of our history. Well, I think what we're talking about is education. And uh, what the, the scenario I presented was done so uh, knowing that a lot of people in the South entertained those thoughts and have those feelings. And I guess it may just be a function of generational shift, you know, that as, as time move, marches on, um, and people become more open to hearing the other side, that's the purpose after all of today's conversation, then you can begin to shift your own thinking and become more acceptable, perhaps, more accepting perhaps of some of these um, physical changes in the landscape and other, in other ways. Um, let me just ask Carl and, and uh, Robert if they'd like to, have, if they have any comments based on what we've just gone through. Uh, I do, Robert, you go first. Yeah, let me, let me uh, it, there's so much to respond to that I can't really do it. Um, so, let, so let me just try. Um, one, um, uh, I'm not gonna go down the empathy road because I, obviously I think everyone agrees on that point. Um, but I will say this, um, I am in the, y'all are uh, in the, uh, uh, the stratosphere looking at the big picture and I'm actually in the field uh, doing specific things. So for example, the Denmark Vesey statue, you know, I wrote a check for that. And I got the city of Charleston to help approve that, number one. Number two. I'm sorry, what was that, Robert? What statue? Uh, well, Denmark Vesey was the leader of the slave revolt of 1822. Um, and um, so we have a statue of him now in Hampton Park. So I also wrote an op-ed with Bernie Powers who's an African-American professor at the college, saying that we should build a world-class monument to the African-American heroes of the Civil War on the Battery in Charleston. And let me tell you how much traction that got. Zero. And here's why you had me on this program. Because I can call BS on all this. No one is interested in building a monument People are only interested in tearing down monuments. Let me repeat mm -hmm. that. No one is interested in building monuments. People are only interested in attacking uh, the racist legacy of America. People are emoting, they're angry. They're not doing anything constructive, nothing. Um, so, so when you talk about build monuments to other people, good luck. Uh, I, I tried that in Charleston. It went nowhere. 
um, with regard to putting things in museums. Robert, if I may just interrupt one second. Now, when you talk, when you say it went nowhere, is that because the city was not interested? There were no other interested donor parties? No one was interested. I call all of my African-American friends who are in politics. I talk to the people at the International African-American uh, Museum. I made phone calls to various people. I talked to city council. No one's interested in that. And the reason no one's interested in it is it's not part of the culture war which is going on, all right? Number two, this business about putting monuments in museums. We, we took down the monument of John C. Calhoun, who by the way, died 11 years before the Confederacy was ever established. But forget that, he was the foremost proponent of the institution of slavery in America. So of course, he's not exactly a, a guy you wanna have a statue of. We can't find a, a museum to put it in. You know why? People are too angry and there's no museum that will take it. And I doubt that it will ever go into a museum. So this bit, th there used to be this argument, we'll take them down, we'll treat them with respect, we'll put plaques, we'll put them in museums. Oh, the debate's way past that now. No, the radicals have moved the debate way past that point. So no, there's no peace on any of these subjects. In reality, you, know, you can talk about it, but you're just wasting time. Now, with regard to naming things. The, the most hilarious debate that has gone on is this business with Yale University. It took everything I could muster to be quiet while y'all were talking, okay? Because <laughs> Yale University is named for Elihu Yale. And in case you don't know, Elihu Yale was a rich slave trader from India and Africa who made millions of dollars trafficking in the slave trade. He makes John C. Calhoun look like a piker. Uh, Elihu Yale made money by murdering and transporting people. And guess who transported all of the African American, all of the Africans to America? New Englanders, 70% of the slave trade was in Rhode Island. Yale was built on slavery. Yale owned plantations that owned slavery. Today at Yale, and yet, so Yale is actually named for the worst slave trader and the worst racist in all, I mean, Calhoun, this poor Smith at the College of Charleston, he's nothing compared to Elihu Yale. Um, you've got these colleges. I know as a Harvard person, you're happy to Point you to <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a Harvard person, I'm happy to elaborate even further. But John <laughs> Harvard has its own problems. Georgetown University, my I went there for law school. Yeah. They're making amends. They have a project they sold. Yale is not making amends. Well, they should. Well, they're not. Jonathan Edwards, George Berkeley, Jonathan Trumbull, Ezra Stiles, Timothy Dwight. Um, and how about good old Cotton Mather? Uh, slave owners all. Every college at Yale is named for a slave owner. So the hypocrisy that comes out of the New York Times, all right, about John C. Calhoun and the South, excuse me, all right, New York City, Boston, New England made a fortune in the slave trade. Brown University was built with slave money. The Brown family were the largest slave traders in New England. It so happens that Brown University actually is named for an abolitionist. So, so they actually have a little footnote there that gets them out of the picture. But all of the money that created Brown University was on, on, in the slave trade. So what I find highly amusing about this debate is that when it comes to John C. Calhoun, they pluck him out and throw a bone and say, oh, we got rid of John C. Calhoun. But, the tr but if you really want to tell the truth about American history, the truth is that New York City Boston, Newport, and Providence were built on the slave trade. And, um, and so if we're going to start changing names, Yale needs to be number one. He, 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 Thomas Jefferson is nothing compared to L.U. Yale. So that's my problem with it. There's no, there's no logic to it. It's, uh, Kathleen, there is a, um, a professor and a historian at the College of uh, Charleston, Adam Dombey, and I, yes. forgive me if I'm pronouncing his last name, in, in 
improperly, but he wrote a book, The False Cause, Fraud, Fabrication, and White Supremacy in Confederate Memory. And, um, and one of the things that he points out, and I think it's important for, for, this, for this panel and for everyone who's watching to, to, to understand is put the Confederacy in the context of today. White supremacists are holding on to whatever that quote unquote white um, white history, you know, is, and it, and it is in that name that they do the things that we've seen happen to people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, to the to the to the U.S. Army uh, person who was in fatigues last week and had Virginia policemen put a gun to him, and you know, and when he said, "I'm scared," they said, "You should be scared." So, all of that has to be put in in, in the proper context. And I would ask for my three. Um, you know, white colleagues on this panel, would you in another life want to come back as a black person and face all the things that Jonathan and I have faced through our lifetime and that other African-Americans throughout the country are facing? I, I, I would gather to, to, to guess that most people would say no way. Well, you know, more white people were killed by police in this country last year than black people. And that's true every single year. I don't As know a percentage that, of population, is that what you're saying? Well, no, I'm talking about raw numbers. And then if you say percentage of population, then we get into questions like, but compared to police stops. And I, I, and I don't want to get okay. into all that because I'm not, I'm not talking about police brutality. I I'm think police, policing should be reimagined in this country. But from where I sit and I covered police and crime for many years, um, the police unions have a lot more to do with what's going on on the streets of these big cities than John C. Calhoun. But you know, but that's another conversation. I'd be happy to have that. But let's go back to this thing because I thought what both I, I, what Robert and Jonathan and Michelle said, I find myself mostly in agreement with it, is that we need to be honest about our history. And you know, I don't, I didn't go to Yale or Harvard, so I don't have a dog in that fight, Robert. But but what but, but Harvard issued a report um, when this started, this reckoning that Michelle talked about, that Georgetown University prompted this. And they said, we got some money from donors and they were in the slave trade and we feel bad about it. And we're, we're thinking of ways to make amends. And, and I guess what I would suggest is that we need to think about history in a rich and full way. 176 Harvard men marched off um, to fight for the union, to free slaves who died. More than a thousand went. Some of them fought for the Confederacy too, but 176 Zions of Boston marched with Grant and Sherman and died, never came back. And, and that's, that's part of Harvard's legacy too. Um, this statute in Boston that you mentioned, Kathleen, that was taken down because it showed uh, an African-American, a freed slave as a supplicant to Lincoln. I've seen in the Washington Post and New York Times allusions to that, that Frederick Douglass didn't like that statute. But that's not true. Frederick Douglass was there the day the statute was commemorated. He was the featured speaker and he spoke highly of it. And, you know, so if we're going to talk about race and we're going to we're going to do the revisionist history, revisionism isn't, isn't a word for wrong. Revisionism is trying to get it right. But 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 we don't want to see that through ideological blinders based on modern politics. We want to see the full picture of what these people went through. And, you know, when we, we talk about the great harm to African-American families of slavery and Jim Crow and in mass incarceration and all these ills, but there were, you know, again, 200,000 white Union soldiers lost their lives and their widows suffered for generations in an agrarian economy. Their parents took care of them. They, there were another, you know, half a million with missing legs or arms who couldn't do farm work. This, this country's history is rich. And, it, you know, just to go from Lee's lieutenants where we glorify these war criminals to now saying that, you know, everything that happens on the streets of America is a legacy of racism. This is sort of an equally broad brush and it's equally inaccurate. And my only pitch to people is when we're talking about people, let's be precise, let's be fair-minded, let's approach it with a spirit of generosity. Let's not forgive unforgivable sins and slavery was one. But, you know, my hometown of San Francisco they, the school board came up with, you know, there are 44 mon schools they want to rename, including Lincoln and Jefferson, <clears throat> not just them, but uh, James Lowell. And the, the school board had in its little thing, uh, he didn't want black people to vote. Well, he worked hard to get the vote for blacks. It was just an error. So we, we don't want to, we don't want to do, 
you know, this lost cause uh, myth that did so much harm. We don't want to now do that in reverse. And that, that's my appeal to people, wherever they are in this debate, is let's be precise in who we're talking about. And let's have a, a, let's give credit where it's due and sort of try and be bigger than our ancestors were, not smaller. Well, I think that's a very nice um, closing remark from you, Carl, because you've summed up, I think, the way we all feel and why we gathered here today to have this conversation. Um, before we sign off, uh, does anyone want to add a final note? Uh, I would actually like to add a final note and not to stomp on your, <laughs> your, your lofty, lofty rhetoric there, Carl. Um, but I do think it would be helpful in terms of having these conversations that when people who, are, who have been in the fight to take down the monuments and calling for a fuller version of American history, our history, that they not be called radicals. That's not helpful. That's not civil. And that's not, that's neither empathetic, nor is it uh, in keeping with the overall goal here to Carl's point to be, you know, very precise in how we talk about this and how we, and how um, we, or I should say the folks who are talking, who are like on the ground in the monuments issue, um, to be mindful that people are coming at this from, from sure, a place of pain. I wouldn't belittle it by saying e that it's all emotional. It's coming from somewhere. Uh, and we need to recognize that uh, and in some ways honor that. But, that. but by honoring that, that doesn't mean that we have to agree 100% with what people are saying, the particular statue or monument that they want to remove. Um, I think that this is a conversation that should be had um, civilly. It's, you know, most likely never going to happen, but it needs to happen because this country um, is changing. It's changed a whole lot uh, since the 60s. And, you know, we have people in this country who want to see their lives, their history, their ancestors reflected in the full telling of the history of our country. And last thing I'll say, uh, um, Mr. Rosen, um, keep pushing to get that statue of Denmark Vesey uh, in Charleston. Keep pushing. I mean, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, it didn't just plop down on the mall uh, in, you know, with one bill and one signing. It took a very long time and a lot of persistence. And that's what I would say to you and anyone else who wants to erect monuments to other American heroes who are not white, um, who, you know, Harriet Tubman, fill in, fill in um, the blank, you named a lot of them in that op-ed, other op-ed that you wrote, uh, Mr. Rosen, keep pushing because it is a, it, it, it is a, uh, an activity that is worth doing and a patriotic activity. Kathleen, I would, just, I would just echo that. And that is that I think the solution to the monument pro so-called problem is to fill in the blanks with, that are missing. I mean, we're, we're missing, you know, uh, monuments to, to more African-Americans. And, and Charleston has created this International African-American Museum um, and the Denmark Vesey statue exists. It's in Hampton Park. With, with, what I'm saying is there's more to add. I think addition rather than subtraction is the point I guess I'm trying to make. So that's kind of my message, you know. All right, well, we're out of time. Uh, we've kept you all long enough, but I wanna thank you all for your contributions to this very important conversation. I'm not sure we solved the puzzle, but you've certainly provided food for thought and I hope your comments receive the wide attention they deserve. Um, and I hope that this conversation does continue and that maybe you all will come back and we'll continue it um, among ourselves and um, for hopefully sometime in the near future in person. To our audience, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, thank you.